Hey folks, welcome to a very special Encore presentation of Enterprise Security Weekly. The hosts and production crew are taking the week off, so we're flashing all the way back to episode 244. I interviewed Juliet Okafor, CEO and founder of Revolution Cyber. Julia is a security expert with a law degree. I love interviewing security folks who have a strong background in an area that's completely outside the industry. For this interview, we focus on the human side of things, how good CISOs can build bad security programs. In short, we learn that soft skills are absolutely critical to the success of a security program, and Juliet gives some great guidance on how things tend to go wrong. We had a ton of fun recording this interview, and I think you'll have a ton of fun listening to it. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Uh, Julie Okafor, the CEO and founder of Revolution Cyber. Julia is a doctor of law who combines her knowledge of legal system, the legal system with her knowledge of cyber to help her Fortune 500 clients succeed. Julia is a strategist who can turn a problem into a plan, especially when it involves people and process, which is right along the lines of what we'll discuss today. Welcome, Jules. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, so first off, why would you shift away from a promising career in law to the hot mess we've got going on right now in cybersecurity? There's got to be a story there. <laughs> oh, there, there's there's quite the story. I don't even know if we have enough time. Um, <laughs> my parents are quite disappointed in, in my decision. Um, I, I thought I'd be an attorney, but I found the practice of law quite boring. Um, I was good at writing briefs, but the idea that I wouldn't have the matlock finishes um, made it so I didn't want to practice for the rest of my life. Got into cybersecurity, and now I practice law every single day. <laughs> <laughs> Disappointed in you like you're a professional gamer or like, I mean, what's wrong so, with cyber? My background is I'm Nigerian. Um, my parents, ha they gave me four career choices. I could either be an engineer and that is a computer engineer, traditional, not software. Um, I could be a professor, a doctor, or a lawyer who practices in courtrooms. I am neither of those things. And yeah. therefore, they don't know how to quantify my success. And therefore, they're not sure if they can be proud of me. So that's, yeah. that's really what this is about. It's about whether my parents are proud of me. And they are not. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> lots welcome, of therapy. welcome to the therapy show. Welcome to the therapy exactly. show. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> lots of lots of therapy it costs me a lot per week, but it's okay. I'm getting through it. <laughs> well, a yeah, good thing that, your that's... parents didn't set a low bar or something on you. I mean, you know. <laughs> well, that is I my mean, father has a PhD. Um, actually, he has two, uh, so he's he's the one who dang. who sets the bar. Yeah. Dang. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, so I mean, part of the point here is is that legal background comes in handy, right? Yes. The future of cybersecurity is um, going to require backgrounds that are non-security, non-technical. Uh, and so the combination of my skill sets are I'm an attorney with two marketing degrees and I've had at least, you know, over 15 years in sales. So I am very knowledgeable about what it feels like to be rejected and CISOs are rejected all the time inside organizations. So I can help them through that. But I think also fundamentally, I'm very adept at learning how to influence and helping people to do the things that they don't want to do, even when they know they should and may not be able to afford it. So the sales background, I think, has been the most helpful in my career in helping CISOs to develop the kinds of skills they need in building out security programs. And, and you're in that magical position I don't know why it is this way. Maybe, maybe, maybe you can en enlighten me, but because you don't work for the company, you can say the same exact things that they've been saying till they're blue in the face. And, and the, because it comes from an outside consultant, they're like, oh, yeah, that, that makes sense. Yes. <laughs> and of course, because the people they there are like, we've been saying that for two years, right? It literally is because someone wrote a check 
And so they're like, someone's paying her. It's got to be that she's smart or we agree with something she's saying. Um, I also have the ability to not accept additional work um, and to say no. If you're an employee, you can leave. It's It tends to be a little bit more difficult, a lot more complexity. So yeah, as a third party, um, I'm viewed as objective and I can speak more bluntly than I think you can from the inside. Absolutely. So often, you know, I think when people think about cybersecurity problems, they tend to think more, you know, and maybe I'm projecting here, but they tend to think more about technical problems and, and solutions, you know, but when I analyze breaches and of course, you know, my, my time spent on the, on the enterprise side, you know, the, the pattern there is, is not a lack of security products and technical controls in my experience. It's generally that things have broken down at the people and process level. Uh, why is it we so often see that we see broken or ineffective processes in infosec there are several reasons i I like to identify at least four um why why we continue to see the same problems over and over again and they're really legitimately i think helen Patton uh asked the question on linkedin just the other day whether there's been a solution to any of the problems that have occurred in security in the last 15 to 20 years and there has not been primarily because one Security leaders are change agents. They are not uh, technical leaders. Uh, They are not technologists. They are designed to go into organizations and make swift, rapid change. And many of them don't see themselves as that. Secondly, many go in trying to immediately establish control and see themselves as needing to create what, what is a fiefdom. So I'm going to go into the organization, create all of these you know, uh, teams, policies, rules, and then I'm going to exert them on everybody. And because everyone should believe in what it is I'm doing, because I was brought in by the board to get this done, then they must do it. They must do. And they they tend to be either walked out of the buildings, unceremoniously fired, or, you know, really alienated and told, you know, not to speak in meetings that are, that are of, of consequence. The third reason I find is there's a measurement of activity over outcomes. It is not important that you have so many events and incidents and you've got so many mitigations and so many frameworks and that many regulations. It is important whether you've met, you've helped the organization to meet its revenue requirements, you've met your board KPIs, you've helped the organization to meet its responsibilities to clients, you've protected the organization from so many threats. Those are outcomes rather than activities. And I think the conversation has to shift in ways that are conducive to discussion that allows for quality over quantity. I think that's really where a lot of it gets lost. And finally, there is too much congratulation of CISOs awarding themselves, um, self-aggrandizing, you know, all kinds of things that have eat their defining success for themselves. One of the clearest ways I can tell whether CISO is successful is by asking their peers. Almost always there's disagreement about the level of success that was achieved, mostly because success is not measured by how you define yourself. It is about your ability to mobilize success for others. And if you are not able to make your peers successful, it's very likely you weren't successful. So those four things across the board uh, end up making these security, when I look at security programs, they are failing. But because there are echo chambers of people saying how great they are, and then the same bad CISOs or great CISOs with bad programs move from one company to another, we continue to see the same repeat habits over and over again. It sounds like fam- family counseling. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like, it does. It, it, uh, there actually is a great deal of that. Yeah. It's interesting because when, when I've um, trained salespeople, you know, therapy, you know, it kind of that way of thinking about it. You know, like like letting CISOs talk about their problems, you know, li- doing a lot of listening, basically, instead of assuming you know what their problems are and how to fix them. You know, it, it, I, I think a lot of it, you know, in, in selling stuff to CISOs. But, um, but yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so, yeah, you, you know, the, the uh, metaphor to fiefdoms, you know, it sounds like immediately they're putting up these walls uh, between themselves yes. and the rest of the business. Yes. And what we find when I talk about this idea of a moat is that the technology becomes the reason why they can't connect. Although technology is viewed often as an enabler and built as a bridge, 
Uh, cybersecurity leaders, I find, often use technology as a reason why they don't have to communicate. Um, and so they aren't doing um, a number of CISOs are not going out um, of the office to, to do meetings, um, um, you know, outside. They're not um, having, you know, in-person meetings, taking walks. They're not, you know, facilitating even via Zoom. Um, a lot of it is I'm going to let, you know, the chat do the talking. I'm going to allow my email communication to do the work for me. And it is having an impact on their ability to deliver a result at the most important time that, that it's needed. Um, oftentimes, it, I talk about this idea of early often. The communication style is, I'm going to need political capital. I'm going to need uh, my relationships. At the times when I'm either got my back against the wall, there's a major deadline, or this project can't fail. That's typically the time I feel like uh, security leaders are reaching out and it's the worst time to do so. So, so I'm, what I thought I'm hearing you saying is that it's not just, it's really not just sending out email blasts or IM blasts. It's, it's yes. building the relationship, the trust with the business, the learning what's important on both sides of the table, that that's actually like hard and scary for some folks, but it sounds like it's undervalued in terms of the CISO's priority list. Am I, am I reading it, you right? Yes, it, it is actually the most undervalued. Um, what, what, what happens the most is huge budgets, millions of dollars are spent on technology. Um, and then at the tail end, <laughs> when all the money's spent, they'll say, I've set aside $20,000 for a communications campaign. But if the communications campaign fails, the 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 technology won't succeed. So it's almost like there needs to be a rethinking about what it is technology is designed to do and how communication and, and, and I talk about change management, change and driving change enables that technology to succeed. In fact, if you're working the people area and you're leveraging process, you're re-engineering re it, you're working with different groups to restructure, the technology will be easier. But I think we're working backwards, and that's why we continue to get the same poor results. I have heard of so, models where we put cyber professionals, as not really professionals, but they're, they're really, they're sitting in the business unit at a senior level and their job is to interface with the CISO types to make sure that the message is heard in both direction. Is that a helpful yes. kind of a model or is this something that belongs more in the CISO's realm? Um, it is one step better. What I'll say is, um, I, I think Adrian, you and I talk about this. So there is this desire to embed security in the business so that security is not, it, security has an opportunity to hear uh, business as it's happening, to be able to respond in real time. And it actually is able to um, engage in that shift left model. So it is being considered earlier in the decision-making process. The challenge with the way it's being done, it is, it's actually being done in a very hierarchical, bureaucratic way in which this person, typically a BSO, is um, directly reporting to the line of business leader, then directly reporting to the CISO. Those two people, the line of the line of the line of business leader, the CISO, they don't talk. Uh, wow. This person now has to report to two different people. They've got to communicate now twice. They've got to speak to the people inside the team. We've just complicated their reporting structure, sometimes complicating their communication. So what we've done is place more responsibility on them, but not provided them the channels by which they need in order to make that easier. So we solved one problem, but then created some new problems. So what we have to do actually is start to embed security within the way in which we communicate across the organization anyway. From the very beginning, when someone comes into the organization, we need to begin to train them on how their role and what the security responsibilities are within that role and have ongoing training that's targeted towards the role. So each person has a fundamental role in security and it's a shared model across the organization. That BSO has less responsibility to both teach, train, communicate. And I think that would be overall the best way to, to handle that. So Jules, it sounds like, so who hires you here? Because it almost sounds like somebody outside the security organization could hire you be like, we're about to fire the CISO, but we, we just want to stage an intervention, see if you can 
you can salvage something here, bring you in. Uh, but on the flip side, I could see a CISO hiring you to have you help them take care of everybody else because they're not the problem. And then That's you come it. in and you have to you have to break that news to them. Does that happen? That so I've been in a situation where I was brought in by the the head of cybersecurity, and I was told they weren't able to get things done because they were meeting all these obstacles. So I, I went in. We we do what we call a cultural assessment uh, across five different areas, and we met with several stakeholders: um, head of uh, marketing, head of HR, uh, head of compliance and also met with their legal team. And each one of them had the same, sim the same or similar feedback. And what it was, was a lack of clear communication on what the objectives were of security and understanding the overlap between security and their role and how to navigate those things. What would happen when there was conflict was that there would be a push back of the other person. So that person would be put off and then no one would speak again. So the security leader thought they don't want to work with me, but that person said, well, they were aggressive towards me. And it turned out that there was responsibility on the security leader's part. It is very difficult to explain to someone who's hired you that they are part of the problem. Um, in, that, in that moment, I have to remind them what their, uh, what their goal is and how quickly they need to show results to the organization so that they'll think less about how painful it is to have to go through that, to have to acknowledge it and start thinking about the lowest, the least tense um, relationship, the one that has the most likelihood to impact them and that would cause them the least frustration. And then we start to go slowly by slowly, slowly by slowly, we, we start to go slowly each to each person and each conversation builds more momentum and we get more support um, in order to get that security leader the kind of support they need. It takes a long time. I think the shortest time I've had to do some of this stuff is six months. But I am oh, traditionally wow. hired by a CISO who has the foresight to understand that they cannot go, go it alone, especially if you're a change agent. You have to enable the people around you. So at least they've taken a step in the right direction, right? In, in understanding that they need help and, and reaching yes. out for that. Yes. So it's a small window, but but there's a growing number of CIOs, uh, chief development officers, chief product officers who are bringing me in because they have a mandate by the organization for digital transformation. Almost always security must be embedded. It must be enabled and it has to happen quickly. So when there's a rapid shift required, we're brought in to control communications, to facilitate conversations and to determine what the outcomes are with clear KPIs. So, so, you know, kind of breaking down some of the factors that you see here, um, sure. you know, obviously the, the CISO personality themselves, um, company culture can be can be a challenge. I know in a lot of organizations uh, for the security team. Uh, and then it sounds like poor relationships, poor communication between them. Uh, are there more factors and are there some factors that you see more often than others? Um, the, the, obviously, there's more factors, but... <laughs> No. There are really strong security programs in toxic work cultures. It rarely exists. Whenever I find a company that is struggling externally with reports of major lawsuits, um, lots of employee complaints, lots of things happening, we may not understand what's going on under the hood, but they have a hard time with building strong security programs, mostly because if you think of security as challenging most of what an organization requires, which is stability, security is always asking the organization to change. Um, in organizations like that, they're trying to get a grasp on a handle on all the things that are changing and developing. They are the, the least receptive to security at that time. Almost always you see them aligned if there was recently a breach or if the security of the organization is fundamentally tied with the business model. So for instance, the Googles and the Apples of the world. But if they are not so intrinsically tied, it tends to be that the worse the work culture, the, the poorly, um, the, the less likely the CISO will be successful in building a strong security program. The other thing, um, when I find organizations that outsource um, almost everything as a part of their culture, uh, security mm -hmm. tends to be a low level priority. 
not because the the because um, I have been in board meetings where the board truly believes in security. However, there requires an investment and a commitment in cybersecurity to get it right. And ultimately, when the organization believes in outsourcing, there is a cultural aspect of it where they believe in distributing responsibility to others. So I often don't see very heavily outsourced models where they have a strong security program, even if the security program has a has a large security um, employee team. And, and then those are things I don't see correlations with, no matter the size of the company. So are you saying that when they're outsourced, they're just the they're, they're outsourcing their commitment as well? That, that it suddenly becomes uh, put it in the box, forget about it. It's not important anymore, or something yes. like that. Yes, there's a heavy focus on technology, a heavy focus on service delivery through socks, and there's also uh -huh. a heavy fo less focus on quality of employee hiring and the way employees are treated. So they have high turnover turnover with employees as well. Ouch. Yeah, that, that sounds yeah, like not a great place to work. I would say so, <laughs> which when, means when, that when it will eventually become outsourced as well. Sorry, go ahead. And when communications and relationships are so important, it, it, it you know, very different from the fiefdom kind of situation that you described earlier uh, when CISOs come in with that mentality. But it's still a wall. You know, when you're outsourcing yes. stuff like that, you're, you're still throwing things over a wall. There's still that mentality of, oh, security is something somebody else does. That's right? it. That's it. Until not, not the bad thing legal. happens, that's, that's it. And you haggle over a contract, a legal piece of paper. Uh, that's not a commitment on any part, anybody's part. I always say um, a contract is made in a handshake. It is made in a verbal agreement. Uh, the, the document is what's written down, but you've really already determined whether you're going to follow the letter of the contract before that. So whenever I see an organization, and if security goes through legal, or finance and and even you know IT, there tends to be less commitment to it than if it goes through operations, the CEO, the CAO sometimes, and the chief risk officer. So there there are patterns that continue to reveal themselves about programs. What you'll hear me say over and over again has nothing to do with the leader themselves. It almost always has to do with external factors that have not that 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 they're not in control of. One of the fallacies that we talk in, in security is we talk about security as though the CISO has control over it, and they really have the least control over all the other things that impact the security program. And that's why good CISOs can build bad programs, because they have the least responsibility and the least influence on whether they're good or bad. They're a passenger. They're just a passenger yeah. down yeah. for the ride. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tyler, I, I want to make sure you get a chance to, to ask questions here. No, I mean, the human aspect of it's always a difficult problem. <clears throat> and relationships, I would argue, are probably the most important piece of it. Um, you know, I think I think a lot of it has to do with a CISO's approach, their overall approach and view into how they're going to build the group. Um, so, no, I, I, I agree completely um, what, with what Jules has said to date. So, yeah, spot on. What, what do you think about, though, this... Why are we seeing the billions and the millions, though, in technology investment? I just heard about the billion number. I was like, yeah. wow. Yeah, I actually saw recently a trillions, um, in M&A trillions number this year or something like that. And I don't know if it was just uh, cyber M&A or global m and I don't remember. But either way, it's, um, you know, a lot of money goes into tools. A lot of money goes into building companies, building products, uh, building vendors, right? Um, yes. And that's because it generates revenue and it generates money for the tool makers it may or may not make security any better and i've been around the security right. world for for long enough to know that you know it, it does make things better but there is better? no tool that's an overall panacea that solves all yes. problems and that's why you get the whole defense in depth slash expense in depth expense model in depth. yes yes right it just costs a ton to fix the problems at any level of depth and I think it's because risk is non-linear. Risk is not binary, right? You can't just go do X, fix problem, right? It's, yes. it's not that simple. Um, no. And so you get a breadth of tools, you get a breadth of processes, you get a breadth of people that are required to solve the problem. And that's why, you know, major banks have 3,000 to 5,000 employees dedicated to cybersecurity, yes. right? It's right. just yeah. not and, something you can flip a switch on. No. And, and Jules, I, I think you nailed it earlier when you talked about the the lack of focus on outcomes. 
you know, the falling into this trap where you feel like you're doing stuff because you're busy. Yes. I, yes. I think that's where a lot of these products come in is they make people feel like, you know, they put them on the treadmill, right? Like that's they're not it. going anywhere, but, but they're getting exercise. <laughs> and quite literally, um, one of the, the, uh, the other um, audio books, books I was listening to by John Carter, what he was saying is the, part of the problem with technology is that um, the producers, the, the, the coders, everyone who builds technology is rewarded for an incremental change. As long as there is an incremental improvement on what existed before, even if you think about the agile model, as long as it's better than it was by a little bit than before, you're rewarded with millions, trillions, billions of dollars. But actually our industry requires wholesale rapid change. That can only be done in people in process, but that's not rewarded in the same way. Once we start to reward people for changing people, for shifting mindsets and processes in the same way we reward for technology, we will see the shift. It's, it's why we're not seeing the shifts that we need to see in, in the industry. What, yeah, what book was that? Um, it's called Changes by John Carter. Well, it's, it's a super interesting point. You know, <clears throat> when I think back over the, over the course of my career and I, I think of markets or technologies or products or vendors that have had significant security success, um, they, they're, they're one of two things. They tend to be human process changes, a la Microsoft yes. in the early 2000s when they declared, hey, we're going to do security right for our business. Yep. And they started putting in tons of massive amounts of, of procedural and people changes to fix the problem at a broad level in their products. And things yep. got better. Um, yep. So that's kind of the one storyline. The other storyline is getting ahead of it. Um, from an engineering standpoint, if we think of, and I know, again, this isn't a technology that's perfect, but the technology story could be like, hey, Apple wrote their stuff, their phones in a secure manner from the get-go. And there's been, yes. some, and, and, and even mobile in general um, is more secure than desktop. Why is that? Is that because of putting in people and processes in place? This is my guess, putting people and processes in place to build that technology from the ground up as a securely designed platform? Probably so, right? So yeah. again, it gets back to having the right people in the right place at the right time to do security, both in a product manner and and in a generic or generalized enterprise manner. It requires people. It requires yeah. skills. It requires human thinking. There is no tool that's going to fix everything. I completely agree. And I think you have to have the ability to separate the maintenance of your current products from what would be the future build of a new product designed to completely approach that people process thing. Um, Apple, I think that um, I was just listening to that to the audiobook and they were saying um, the way in which change is happening with with technology. I think the iPhone was able to kind of catapult within 12 years. I think they oh, I think the iPhone was within three years um, before that. It so I think IBM, it took like 60 years. So they're, they're basically saying like the speed of change is rapidly happening, but we're still not at a point that is happening rapidly enough to keep up with the shift in the way humans are behaving. So until we can get ahead of it, we won't be able to see the change we need, especially on the security side. I think we think that we can't control mindsets, but marketing has figured out how to change mindsets. Think about consumers and how we buy. That's shifted substantially since at least even I was a kid. So I would say that we've got to bring some of that to the forefront, which is what I'm trying to do. How do we take marketing, neuroscience, brain research, bring it into security so we can teach people what they need to know and they can also be part of the solution in solving our cybersecurity challenge yeah. and not discussing awareness because that's another problem that we could talk about. <laughs> but you're talking about... <laughs> You're, you're you're building you're building an allegiance and 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 partnership there with you're not scaring them that their world's going to end or they're not going to be able to get their objectives met which is really exactly. important and we can leave the a exactly. word on the floor <laughs> and in some ways and i'll say this with my quiet voice in some ways i talk about this idea of cyber diplomacy and this idea of propaganda if you really think about it if you think about what marketing is designed to do, it really is about getting into subconscious thoughts and leveraging that for the purpose of action. Um, we've got to start to do that better inside organizations for the purpose of the greater good, but in ways that don't that 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 respect 
um, privacy, respect people's ability to say no. That's the hard part is on the outside, we've agreed in ways that we allow, you know, the marketplace to convince us to do things we don't even know we're doing. But inside organizations, there's a limit, there's a cutoff. The question is, how do we convince people that they want to do the thing that they don't know that they want to do, but we really need them to do now? And that's a whole shift in mindset from the top down. We have to have approval from the organization's board all the way through C-suite. And then we've got to keep building it into the way in which we're communicating inside the organization. I think security and, and the organizations I work with, they understand the fundamental need to do that and they're doing that. But that's that's what I've seen um, is, is a trend. And I think where product security is involved, DevOps, that shift is happening rapidly, most rapidly. Yeah, and I, I think it's a healthy um, change too, you know, getting away from this idea that people are going to do security because it's security, you know, of yes. course you, you have to do it because, because we said it's important, <laughs> you're going to do it, you know, and more of this mindset that, you know, no, you need to learn to compromise. You need to yes. sell it. You know, you, you, you gotta, you, you know, nothing, very few things in security are just a hundred percent. You got to do it. You know, there, yes. there's not a whole lot of airbags and seatbelts <laughs> in security. It's always, and you know, so it's gotta be beautiful. It's gotta do. be. Uh, can you imagine the kind of beautiful, well-designed ads we see when we are at home and then the kinds yeah. of horrible security awareness videos we see in the office? Like, why would <laughs> I want to do what you're asking me to do? It's like, you either think I'm an idiot or a kid, right? It's, it's almost insulting. Yeah. Uh, when I That's ask nice. users, you know, what they think about security awareness videos, they immediately grimace or they make really loud sounds. They're like, ugh, you know, they hate it. But we keep feeding it to them because we hope something will convince them, not even convince that they'll just do it and leave us alone. Uh, we've got to get away from that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so one more question for you and, and, and we'll wrap sure. up here. I, I wish we had a full hour, but, um, I know. <laughs> but we got to get, we got to get moving here. Um, what, you know, kind of curious if if there is anything you can point out. Um, where do you find your light bulb moments most often with clients? You know, is is there a particular topic or, or a way that you lay things out that that makes uh, things click with them? You know, if if they've been really looking at things the wrong way, you know, do do you have kind of go tos that help people get to that point to where they can they can start? Um, you know, where maybe they don't need your advice <laughs> on a day to day, you know, they can check in maybe weekly and they're heading in the right direction. I thought I just asked a really thoughtful question. You did. You stumped her, man. You, 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 you stumped her. You scared her away. That was a really good question. <laughs> and what's funny oh, is I, I was. I was considering rapping there. <laughs> well, now's a good um, opportunity to rap, Adrian. <laughs> all right. So I, I had several. That was like I was choosing between like one of five. So we'll just have to have Jules back on. <laughs> That's all there is. We'll to bring it. her back on uh, soon. That was an almost perfect place to rap. Yeah, I, I should have just wrapped there. So um uh, Jules, you know, so, sorry, you know, that that happened. Uh, thank you for joining us in Enterprise Security Weekly today. You can learn more about uh, uh, Jules's company, Revolution Cyber, uh, at revolutioncyber.com. Also, she will be speaking at InfoSec World. Listeners can go to securityweekly.com forward slash ISW 2021 to save 20% on their digital pass and check out her talk. 